Okay, so the, the start off with the oxygen delivery. The first thing that we start with is the SpO2. SpO2, like it says, is the partial pressure of oxygen in a capillary bed. You obtain this before applying oxygen to the patient, and the norm is 95 to 100 percent. So I think everybody has seen a little little clip like this, like on TV, right? Mm -hmm. And this is the uh, pulse oximeter. It measures the SpO2, it measures the partial pressure of oxygen in this capillary bed here. And this is for another day when we get more a little bit of patient assessment. But this capillary bed in the finger, and it can go on any capillary bed, okay? So before you put oxygen on the patient, all right, you would get the pulse oximeter here and there, right, in your assessment, and put it on their finger. And then when you look down into it, it, there's a little graft on there, but that's not. That's just for show on, on this particular one. On a cardiac monitor, it's not for show. It's called a pleth, and a, a SpO2 pleth. Let me draw. May look something like this. Okay, probably not, but you'll see a real pleth here in a bit. Okay. So you see an SpO2 plaque. If you're used to reading waveforms, you look at this and say, yeah, they have a good plaque. So, you know, but until then we look at numbers, right? So on the SpO2, put it on the patient's finger, measure the partial pressure of oxygen, 95 to 100 percent. And I'm at 98, so I'm good. And I'm caffeinated, so I'm at the pulse rate of 80. So when you look at this, geez, 92. Okay. Uh, so I'm look, I'm okay. Yeah, 60, 100, right? <laughs> My normal resting heart rate's like 60, uncaffeinated, like 64. So anyway, <clears throat> so you look at 87. So the 87, the pulse rate has to correspond with the mechanical pulse. You have to have, it has to be pretty close. So if there's 87 on here and 60 here, right, then you can't really take this. Uh, it's not accurate, you know. Uh, fingernail polish can mess it up. Cold hands can mess it up. Vasoconstriction problems can mess it up. That's all we'll get into the abnormal stuff later. Okay, we're just looking at the norms now. And then I'm 98%, I'm at 87, so I'm okay, all right, so pass that around and uh, look at the SpO2. So we want to get a room air SpO2. So a room air RA, room air SpO2 before we apply oxygen. Now here's the thing with oxygen, we'll get into oxygen, oxygen therapy a little bit later, but the American Heart Association says if there's no outward respiratory distress, if they're not having dyspnea or increased work of breathing, and their SpO2 is above 94%, they don't get oxygen. That's been a change for about eight years now, okay? But providers still do that. They have someone with chest pain, there's no outward respiratory distress, and they're 98% on room air, and they say, oh, they're having chest pain. Put a nasal cannula on them. No. All right? We'll, we'll speak of that. That's for a later day. All right? So we would apply oxygen at an SpO2 below 94% or any signs of dyspnea. Right? Difficulty breathing or work of breathing. Increased work of breathing. And we're... These are definitions for a later day, but those are signs. So if I have a work of breathing, increased work of breathing, or dyspnea, uh, or an SpO2 below 94%, <clears throat> then I would apply oxygen. Okay. So how do we do that? Right? We'll get back to Boone. Okay. So we have an oxygen cylinder. And the first thing we have to do is we have to identify. Oxygen is a drug. You can't go to Walmart and buy it. Right? You have to have a prescription for it. 
So uh, you can tell that this is an oxygen cylinder three ways. You want to identify it just like any drug three. You want to be able to identify it. So I identify this as a, hang on, I need to get my key. identify this as an oxygen cylinder because the color is one way. It's either completely green or green and silver like this one. Okay, so that's the first way I identify it. The second way I identify it, it says oxygen right here. Go figure, right? But then I have to look here at USP. USP stands for U.S. Pharmacopeia. It used to be this big, huge, thick book, and now it's an app you get on your phone, okay? But every medication in the United States is in the USP. Oxygen is the medication, so uh, it's in there. It's in the USP, so this one's green and silver. That meets that cri criteria. It says oxygen, USP. That means it's medical-grade oxygen, and uh, it's because medical grade oxygen is uh, filtered. And then the other way is the neck of the oxygen bottle, or the cylinder. This happens to be a D cylinder. The ones you will see in the hospital are typically E cylinders. They're just skinny and tall, and they're all green. This is just portable. But the neck of the oxygen cylinder has the two pins in it, two pin index system, okay? So this would be the three ways that you would uh, identify the oxygen cylinder. The color says oxygen, USP, and the two-pin index system. Now, one thing that we don't want to do is ever leave the oxygen cylinder upright like that, uh, unattended. We always want to lay it down for safety. The boom is, I say that, okay? because it's under a, a, quite a bit of pressure, right? This happens to be an oxygen key. The, some of them have a little flip thing on them where you don't need the key. This one, you actually need the oxygen key to open the cylinder with. quite a bit of pressure, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> can, you breathe, can you breathe that in? She was like. So you don't, you don't need some help, okay? With the, this is under 3,000 PSI when it's full, pounds per square inch, okay? So you need a regulator to regulate that flow out there. This is the typical regulator here on a bottle. You, the two holes line up with the two pins, right? Go figure. Okay, you have a gauge on here that tells you the PSI, and then inside you have this big spring. So when you turn it to adjust the dosage or the liter flow, you can do that. So we'll, we'll put this on here. Line the two pins up with the two holes. Hand, hand tighten. <laughs> well, there you go. Regulator, right? Now you adjust the liter flow. Oh, yeah. That's a little nicer, right? So you have to have a regulator on there. When you when you go to the hospital, you see this on the wall. See the green? This is a, a Christmas tree because if you flip it up right, it looks like a little Christmas tree. Okay, but this if this would be oxygen. The green. They might have a yellow one, 
the trap by there, the yellow is just air, okay, for them to mix gases with. So if you were to connect something with, to oxygen in the hospital, this would be there. And then just the leader flow here. There's no air behind here. I'm really working on that to get that set up, but because it's easy to do, really. But um, anyway, this is what this is the setup that you're going to see in, in the hospital. Uh, okay, so how do you breathe in that? I mean, it's, we're breathing oxygen right now, correct? Mm -hmm. What percent? Twenty-one percent, right? Mm -hmm. So we're breathing in oxygen already. So when I administer oxygen to a patient that's having dyspnea or increased work of breathing, right, I, I'm giving them supplemental oxygen. Supplemental means extra. Supplemental income, extra income, right? So you, uh, it's just, so when you administer supplemental oxygen, you have to have adjuncts. An adjunct is a helper, okay, and that's what these are. The the probably the most popular one is this nasal cannula. Okay, you you've seen this on television for sure, right? Yeah. In the nose, mm -hmm. up the little prongs up in the nose. Yeah, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then this is uh, attached to oxygen, plug it into the tree. That's attached attached to the oxygen, right? Now, with any medication, there's an indication, some contraindication, some side effect, right? And a dose. Oxygen's no different. So the, the indication for nasal, oh, there it is, for nasal cannula is mild respiratory distress. Someone that's coming in, maybe they're just having a little dyspnea, they're mild respiratory distress, they're not using retractions or anything, and, and we, we'll get a better definition of this in a few weeks. We're not there yet. We just need to learn the definition for now, okay? So nasal cannula, mild respiratory distress, right? They're not mouth breathing. They're still breathing through their nose. They just have a little dyspnea, okay? Uh, the dose is two to six liters per minute. So the dose for oxygen is measured in liters per minute, all lower cases, liters per minute. So it's two to six liters per minute. Now, the book, the test question is two to six. If you're actually putting this on the patient, then you would go two to four. You wouldn't go six. Six is, is too uncomfortable for the patient. They can't really stand six liters, six liters of nasal cannula, right? So two to four, two to six on the test question. How many liters do you think that I use all the time? It doesn't really matter. If I put this on the patient, I use four, three, three, four, three. Why three? Because well, if you thought about it, that that sounds really good. But I don't think about it. I give everybody three because that's why I remember. That way I don't have to remember, hey, how much oxygen did I give them? Three. So if you're my patient one day, I give you how many? Three. Three. If you're my patient the next day? Three. Three. Right? On a nasal cannula, I give everybody three. So when I go to document that, I go three liters per minute. I don't have to, I don't have to think back. And it's okay because it's a range. I'm, I'm open to give that range, okay, unless I have an order. If I have an order for two, then I give two, right? Because if I have an order, then they're not leaving it up to me. They're telling me to put the patient on two liters. Okay, so here's where we look at the increase in, in oxygen and what it is. Okay, it's a, what we're looking at when we look at this 24 to 40 percent is the FiO2. So we've already figured out we read 21%, right? The FiO2 is fraction inspired oxygen. Fraction percent, right? So the fraction of inspired oxygen. So your FiO2 right now and mine is 
we're not receiving supplemental oxygen. If I was to place a nasal cannula on you, then I would increase your FiO2 to the 24 to 40%, somewhere in there, because we're rebreathing carbon dioxide. Does that make sense? Okay, so fraction inspired oxygen. Room air, 21%. Nasal cannula, I'm increasing that FiO2 to 24 to 40%. Everybody good with the nasal cannula? Okay, let's look at the next one. Okay, the simple face mask, the dose is 6 to 10 liters per minute. It increases the FiO2 44 to 60%. <clears throat> this is sort of, I don't actually have a simple face mask, but if you look at this with the oxygen tubing on the end, it would be this without the hole. Okay, it's just a mask we put on the patient. Okay, the reason we don't have, these are popular with pediatrics, but we don't put them on adults that much because we just put the next one that we'll talk about, the non-rebreather on them, all right? This is just an additional cost that we don't really need, or the hospitals don't want to, to take. So the simple face mask, the indication for a simple face mask is moderate respiratory distress, where they may be using a little retraction, they may be mouth breathing, okay? But the indication is moderate respiratory distress, and you might put a simple face mask on. Um, and it increases their FiO2 to 44 to 60%. So that's another adjunct, another helper that we have. The more popular one is the non rebreather mask. And the dose for the non-rebreather is 10 to 15 liters per minute, and it increases the FiO2 90 to 95 percent, and the indication is severe respiratory distress. So they're using their retract, their accessory muscles, they're retracting, they're belly breathing, right? They're having really trouble, a lot of work of breathing, increased work of breathing. So we give them a, a non-rebreather. We increase their FiO2 to 90 to 95 percent, and these will vary, okay? Depending on what book you read, but this is, this is what's on the test. So. Okay. Anyhow, the thing that's special about the non-rebreather is, <clears throat> we look at it, and we have these, these little leaflets on the side, and then one right here. Why don't we rebreathe with the non-rebreather? Very good, we don't rebreathe carbon dioxide. And the way that it happens is these, these valves. So when the patient inhales, not quite like this, but this valve here that's just above the reservoir bag opens up and they breathe what's in the reservoir bag, okay? When they exhale, this shuts and it blows the carbon dioxide out the side. And then when they inhale, it pulls these in here so they're not breathing in carbon dioxide through the hole, right? So these sort of seal up here, and this one opens on inhalation, this one seals, and these open up with exhalation, okay? The goal with the non-rebreather is to keep this full. You've seen this, and this little thing I'm about to tear off is uh, the nose piece. It just clamps to set it over the nose so we get a good seal. Anyway, you've seen this on TV too, right? Like this with the flat band. Right? That's, that's, that's one of those things when you look at TV, you go, why don't they put air in it or something? Okay? <laughs> because it would be against the standard of care, a little review, right? Yeah. To put a non rebreather on somebody with the reservoir bag not inflated. So we would inflate the reservoir bag first by hooking it to 10 to 15 liters per minute. Okay, so put it at 10 liters per minute. I put my fingers over the, the valve and the reservoir bag fills up, right? Then I place it on the patient and pull the strap over the head, right? I feel like I, the airlines do it, you know? You know what they do on the airplane? Okay, so uh, if you've never been on an airplane, you probably don't know, but anyhow, so non-rebreather, fill the reservoir bag, 10 to 15 liters per minute. If they're having a lot of difficulty breathing, 
and they're collapsing this bag, and you have it at 10, what would you do? Very good. You'd increase the rate. Maybe go ahead and put it at 15, right? Then get ready to start using the next device, probably the bag valve now. So severe respiratory distress, leave a flow of 10 to 15. Make sure that the reservoir bag stays inflated. Now when they inhale, it can come down a little bit. It can decrease, but it never should go flat. It should always stay inflated. That way they're always breathing oxygen out of the bag. Am I good with the non-rebreather? The next one we'll get into later, but I'll just show you now. It's the nebulized mask. Okay, because of the fact that we'll be going to the hospital before we, we get into this. So some of you guys will be respiratory, so you're giving, you're giving breathing treatments to people. Okay, and inside here is a drug called albuterol, one of them, and it's for people who have an asthma attack, emphysema, whatever. And so you would put the, the medication in here, screw that on there, and then hook this to about six liters per minute and it'll create a little mist and then they breathe in the mist, okay? They breathe in the medication, all right? So uh, nebulized uh, respiratory uh, medication, so a nebulized mask, okay? They do have the little peace pipe that the patient holds, but typically they just put them on the mask so the patient doesn't have to hold it, all right? So a nebulizer. Would, We'll, we'll look at this a lot when we get into respiratory. Yeah, same. Uh, same thing. It's just, it's just smaller, right? Right, just smaller. Might be a bear there or something. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Mommy, why is the bear sitting on my face? <laughs> scaring the crap out of me. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah, this is smaller. This just would put on oxygen to that. All right, now the mother of all, in, in CPR on Wednesday, we'll learn, we'll use this. This is the way that we breathe for patients, right? So this is the, let me change this slide. I think it's on the slide. The bag valve mask, the bag. See that little orange red thing in there? If you will, if you can't. Valve mask, bag, bag valve mask, okay, BVM. The slings are then, this is when you bag a patient, get it bagged, right? So when you're breathing for someone using the bag valve mask, all right, the indication would be severe respiratory distress or respiratory arrest, then add on there, comma, pending respiratory failure. So severe respiratory distress respiratory arrest and respiratory failure. So this is the way that we're going to breathe for the patients. Maybe they're not breathing, so we're going to breathe for them, correct? Maybe they're breathing too slow, so I'm going to breathe faster for them. Right? Or maybe they're just about to stop breathing, so I need to breathe for them. I need to help them. Right? We use a bag valve mask. CPR, you learn about a face mask, but this is this is our go-to. Right? When we... Uh, when we want to breathe for somebody. It increases the uh, FiO2 to 95 to 100 percent, closer to 100 percent when you're breathing on an endotracheal tube. These parts here are interchangeable, so this will fit on the, endo, on the endotracheal tube. Like so. Uh, that fit on there. So all these, these hubs are interchangeable, and they're interchangeable masks as, as well. Now, think about it. We want to give them a nice full breath because we're breathing for them. Okay? So, what's the average tidal volume for an adult? 500 milliliters, right? What do you think? the volume of this bag is. So this is an adult bag valve mask. 500, right? So when we squeeze and release, once someone that's not breathing, we breathe 10 times per minute, so six, every six, 
six Mississippi drop, squeeze and release, squeeze and release every six Mississippis. We're breathing approximately 500 milliliters because uh, that's the average tidal volume for an adult. Connect this to oxygen, obviously, or you're breathing what? If you don't have this connected to oxygen, what percent are you breathing? 21%, right? <clears throat> why, why do that when we can have more? <laughs> so connect this to oxygen, the same thing. Make sure the reservoir bag stays full. The dose is 15. Start at 15. You may have to go up a little. Can't go up much more, but you can go up a little. Keep the reservoir bag full. Then you squeeze and release. With the bag valve mask, the seal is important. You have to have a good seal on the, uh, on the mask. And this is something that we will do here in a few minutes, perhaps. We'll make sure that we get a good seal. When we're, when we're holding the mask on, we use an EC method, C, right? E, e EC, get it? E underneath the chin, C around here, so we Press down, get underneath the chin, head tilt chin lift, and then squeeze and release. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, six Mississippi. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi. Right? So squeeze and release. You push down. You push down like the. If you ever had a. Boyfriend break up with you, and <laughs> things don't go very well. Marriage is a little hard break up. Have you ever had that happen? Uh, Yay or nay? Let's just go. No. Okay. So let's say that you've yes. 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 So you've had it happen. <laughs> <clears throat> so you would press this mask on, boy or girl. Okay. <laughs> so you would press this mask down on that girl's face <laughs> like you're trying to make a point. Okay? Because it needs a good seal. Without the good seal, then we lower our FiO2, right? So you're going, yeah, break up with me, huh? <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm going to go 10 Mississippis for I breathe. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm going to breathe really fast and jack you all up. Right? <laughs> so you want a good seal. You want to push down. So that it feels abnormal to push down like that. Uh, the patient doesn't feel it because they're probably either in so much respiratory distress or they're not breathing so they don't know, they're not conscious. And you can bag it. Uh, a conscious patient, but it makes them feel like they're suffocating. Can you imagine putting this on your face when you're having trouble breathing? You can't really feel the air coming out, even though there is that air there, so it makes you feel like you're suffocating. Uh, we we'll use this a lot during the CPR training coming up, okay? But this is the way that we uh, breathe for the patient. Now, we normally breathe off of what type of pressure? Normal respirations occur with blank pressure. Negative. Very good, negative pressure. Okay, we breathe off negative pressure. That was on the con videos, so that sort of showed the coil are pulling one way and the bronchial is pulling the other, perhaps. Does that sound familiar? Okay, good. Uh, so that's negative pressure. This is positive pressure. So when we use a bag valve mask, we create positive pressure ventilation. Okay. We normally breathe on negative pressure. So on the test, you may see use positive pressure ventilation, right? Talking about the bag valve mask. Use the bag valve mask. BVM, use pos the same thing. Positive pressure ventilation, bag valve mask, same animal. Okay? Everybody good there? Pretty easy to get with. Okay. Do you guys have any questions over the oxygen delivery stuff? Good?